I expect that most of you know the, the story of Mordecai and Haman from the book of Esther. It's one of my favorite stories. Mordecai was a Jew in exile. Haman was a high official in the Medo-Persian court. And because Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman, Haman became obsessed with destroying not just Mordecai, but all of Mordecai's people. He wanted to wipe out the entire Jewish nation just because Mordecai would not bow down to him. So Haman launched a, a very elaborate plot to commit genocide against the Jews. And he, all the while, failing to, to recognize that Mordecai just happened to be the uncle of the queen. The, the turning point, if you know the, the story of Esther well, the turning point in Haman's fortunes come in Esther chapter 6. It, it begins one morning when Haman enters the, the court to see the king. He wants to request permission from the king to hang Mordecai. He's built, built these massive gallows and he wants to hang Mordecai before all the people of the city. What Haman doesn't know is that the king had problems sleeping that night. And it just so happened in, in God's providential working of things that the king decided, you know, the sure-fired way to be able to sleep would be, I'll have the chronicler read historical records of the court to me. Now, I'm sure that's got to be some dry reading. I would think that's what he's going through his mind. If I just get a, a set of records read to me, so-and-so did this on so-and-so date, that'll bring the slumber along in no time. Well, it didn't work, but in God's workings of things, the chronicler just happened to open up to a record that recorded how Mordecai was instrumental in foiling a plot to assassinate the king. And the king discovers that Mordecai was never rewarded for his part in preventing his own assassination. Well, right at the time Haman enters the court, the king has just discovered that Mordecai has never been rewarded for preserving my life. So he asks who's in the court and finds out Haman's there, the, this high official of the court. So he calls Haman into his palace. And he asks Haman, what should the king do for a man he wants to honor? Now, I, I, in my mind, I imagine Haman is thinking a lot like us men do when it, our wives' birthdays are coming around. I wonder what she would like. He probably thinks the king is, is feeling me out because he wants to honor me, but he doesn't know what I would like. So he's, he's poking around trying to find out what would be special to me, just like I do with my wife. What would be special? So he says, you know, the best thing to do for a person that you want to, to, to recognize in honor is a lavish gesture. Why don't you take this man and place him on the king's own horse? Why don't you get a robe that is the king's robe and wrap him in that? Why don't you put a crown on his head or a royal crown? And then why don't you appoint one of your high officials to walk before this man and call out in front of all the people, this is what the king does for the man he chooses to honor. Well, the king loves the idea. He loves it so much that he says, Haman, go and do this for Mordecai the man that Haman was coming to hang. So, Mordecai does. He takes, or I mean Haman does, he takes the horse, he takes the robe, he takes the crown, he finds Mordecai, he puts them on, and he leads him around and says, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires. In my imagination, I, I, I see my mind's eye every time Haman verbalizes those words, there's a little tick in his head because he just can't quite get it out. When you read Esther, you recognize Haman has a lot of issues. Fundamental to his issues is the fact that, that he loved to receive honor. He craved it. He, he certainly did not want to honor Mordecai, the, the man who refused to bow to him that he wanted to destroy 
But how about us? How about you and I? Mightn't we have a similar problem? Mightn't we be men and women who seek honor much more than we want to give honor? As we'll see this morning, our concern should lie with seeking the honor of others, not with seeking honor for ourselves. We're, we're coming in our series this morning on, on genuine love to this topic of honor. As we come to this specifically, we're, we're in a series that deals with developing genuine love. We're, we're using the list that Paul gives us in Romans chapter 12 as, as a guide for this series. And in Romans chapter 12, 9, he, he gives us a, a heading a, over the, a list, and he entitles the list, Love Without Hypocrisy. What does genuine love look like? Love without hypocrisy, the real deal. And then he begins to list characteristics in, in the, the verses that followed that. He lists characteristics of what this without hypocrisy type of love would look like, what this genuine real thing would be. So far, we've looked at the first couple of characteristics. First thing he says is we'll abhor evil and cling to what is good. Then he says we'll be devoted one another in brotherly love. I, I trust that you remember Paul's point here, if you've been with us for these first three so far of this series. Paul's dealing with genuine love by telling us that genuine love needs to possess all the things in this list. We, we can't just pick and choose. We can't develop brotherly love or, or be devoted one another in brotherly love without abhorring evil. We have to do all these things. We also are not just getting a list so that Paul can help us identify something as that's the real thing. No, he's encouraging us to do these things. We are to develop genuine love. We are to show it forth in our lives. This morning we're coming to the third of the characteristics Paul gives us. What genuine love looks like, what it needs, what we have to produce to have it. This third characteristic is found in the second half of verse 10 in Romans 12. The, the New American Standard translates this particular item as give preference to one another in honor. There's that troublesome word honor, that, that, that word that Haman stumbled over so badly. Give preference to one another in honor. The main idea that, that we should draw from this phrase this morning is not a hard one to understand as far as what it is. It's not a hard one to articulate. It, it's simply that genuine love seeks honor for others rather than self. Let me read that to you again. Genuine love seeks honors for others rather than self. This is the, the main idea of that phrase. This is the idea that we want to explore this morning. It is drawn right out of Paul's inclusion of this idea of honor within his characteristic of things that genuine love requires. Genuine love seeks honor for others rather than self. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Let's begin exploring why Paul would give us this item in this list. Why do we need to seek honor for others rather than self? Why do we have to have honor as part of genuine love? Well, first, as we explore this, I want us to recognize first that, that we honor what we value. We honor what we value. The, the Greek word that we have translated in verse 10 as honor it is a much more common word than a lot of the th words Paul has already used in this list. We've seen some rather unique words in the, the first couple ideas, but this word is, is a rather common word. It's used 44 times in the New Testament. 30, 33 of those 44 times is used to describe a, a state of placing something in a high respect or, or the quality of high respect. It's the word that we, or the way that we would typically think about honor ourselves in English. Something that's in a high respect. It's the way that honor was used in the Mordecai, Haman's story. Haman had to honor Mordecai. He had to place him in a high re respect. He, the king wanted to demonstrate that Mordecai was worthy of honor because of his part in foiling the assassination plot. 
Mordecai became an honored man through the actions that were taken. He, he was an honored man. He possessed the quality of respect in the eyes of the people as, as the, the fallout of being taken through the city. That's the familiar meaning of the word honor in English. That's this normal Greek word's meaning. Now, some of you may be wondering, what about those other 11 times? Well, the Greek word, it, I'll just mention, is also used to denote financial value. Things that are of high financial value. We would use in English the word price, usually. What is the, the value of something? What is the price of something? I, I think we understand, in general, this idea of honor what the word means anyway, it, it just describes something that we hold in high esteem. The, the word makes sense to us because we all have things that, that we value, things that, that we honor. There, there's people that we hold in high esteem. We understand we honor what we value. A, a week ago, last Saturday, Pastor Aaron and Liz moved into a new house. Several of us helped them load and unload their stuff. And and what I discovered when I was helping is that their stuff is much like the rest of our stuff. There, there were a lot of things that they had that were like what we have. You know, plastic um, clothes baskets. There were a couple of balls that the kids had playing on the deck. There, there was this old plastic play scooter and so forth. There were a lot of things that the Aaron really didn't care how they were handled. We simply chucked them into the truck and, and then we threw them on top of other stuff. No problem. By contrast, there were a few things that, that Aaron did care about how they were loaded and handled. There, there was a nice wood dresser that he wanted to ensure was wrapped in a blanket. There, there was um, a, a piano that he wanted to make sure we didn't break the legs off or, as we put it in, into the truck. There was good living room sectional that they wanted to ensure was was handled in a way that wouldn't be destroyed in the move. And then, when we got to the house, we discovered that there were several boxes that he and Liz had already moved the previous days that had the valuable, fragile things in that he wasn't even going to let us touch. <laughs> Those were the things Aaron cared about. He honored them because they were valued to him. They were valued, or at least... They were maybe more correctly valued by Liz. And Aaron is wise enough to value what his wife values. Which leads me to my second point. Genuine love seeks honor for, those, for others rather than the self. And that, that begins, number one, we honor what we value. But number two, we are to value what God values. Aaron valued what his wife values. We are to honor what God values. Oftentimes, we, we think that a value system is subjective. It, it's based on our, our personal likes. I value my library. You, you've heard me talk about my library before. I value my library. I think my books are special. Yet, I could probably give my books to many of you, and you would wonder, what am I going to do with these? At best, you would probably pile them into a corner of your basement. More likely, as soon as I'm out of sight, you would take the books and somehow they would find their way to a dumpster or a thrift store. To you, my books are not valuable. Yet, what I want us to consider this morning is what we place the highest values on should not be subjective at all. Rather, what we value most should be, term, be determined by what God values the most. If you have your Bibles open in Romans 12, 10, look again at what Paul writes. He says, give preference to one another in honor. To one another. God, through Paul, is telling us what, or, or more specifically, who we should honor. One another. As we discussed last week when we looked at the instruction to be devoted to one another, one another means the people sitting here, the, the people sitting around you. These are our one another's. These are the people that we are to be honoring. One another, that, that's just simply Paul's way of referring to other believers, the, the people who make up the church, the people in this room are our one another's. 
the fact that God is telling us to honor these people means God values them. Of course, if we spend even just a moment thinking about it, it should not be a surprise to us that God values the people in this room. These are the people that God's Son died for. God's Son died to save these people. Jesus Christ went to the cross, gave his life for the people sitting in this room. There, there's nothing more valuable than life itself, and, and Jesus gave his life. The divine Son of God gave his life for you and me. Clearly, the Son of God valued us greatly. He died for us. He gave the most valuable thing that he had. He gave his life. He gave his life so that he could save us from our sin. I'm assuming we know that Jesus died for us. So I won't chase that too far. But if you do not know that Jesus died for you, and you do not know how to know him as your Savior, what it means to accept his sacrifice, to experience his love firsthand, please send me an email this week. Come see me after the service. Let me show you from God's word what it means to know Jesus as Savior, to experience the love of God, to, to know that you're one of the people that his son died for. I would count an honor to do that. Jesus gave his life. He showed his level of value for us by dying so that we would not have to pay the price of our own sin. But we need to remember it's not just the Son of God who valued us. It's not just the Son of God. God the Father values us as well. Where we're told throughout Scripture that, that God the Father is the one who designed and, and actually initiated the plan that results in God the Son going to the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. The Father gave his own Son knowing that he would die. Friends, the reality is there is few things in life that are more valuable than life itself. But there are a few things that are more valuable to us than life itself. Our children are usually one of those things. I never doubted that if the situation arose where I had to give my life to save the life of my child, that I would do so without hesitation. I knew that I would sacrifice myself. They're, they're more precious to me than my own life. If I'm brutally honest with myself, I, I, I admit that while I hope I would be willing to step in front of bullet for any of you, I don't know if I would. If push comes to shove, I don't know if I would. I'd like to think I would, but I don't know. But my children... There's not a doubt in my mind. I value them more than I value my own life. God the Father gave his son, knowing that his son would die a horrendous death stretched out on the cross, a death filled with suffering and agony. He gave his son so that you and I could live. His actions show the extent to which he values the people sitting in this room. We are objects of God's grace. We are the, the displays of his great love. The, the hard-bought trophies of God's own son, that's who we are. God values us. And for that reason, we are to value one another. Here is where we probably all need some help. When you look around this room, what do you see? Do you see someone who has offended you? Do you see someone who has disappointed you? Do you see someone who has irked you? Do you see someone who is different, at least from the way you would define normal and different? Do you see someone who is embarrassing? Do you see someone who is selfish, loud, deceitful, sinful? The list can go on. What do you see? 
When you look around the room, do you see someone who is valued by your God? Do you see someone who's been saved by grace? Someone who's been bought by the blood of Christ? Someone who is valuable because your Savior values that person? Now, I know I've used this illustration before, but it's, it's so fitting that I'll use it again. I now have a son-in-law and a daughter-in-law. I have both in my life now. And the reality is that as individuals, they would most likely hold no special place in my affections were it not for the fact that they married my daughter and my son. In David's case, if he had not married Katie, he would most likely be like her other classmates. I, I would know who he was, and I may know what he's doing at this point in his life. I know several of her classmates, what they're doing, but by and large, I don't know a whole lot about what's going on with them, and, and I expect in a few years they will just simply go out of my life so much that I never think about them again. In Maria's case, who married my son, it's likely that if she had not come into my son's life, I would not even know who she was. And yet both David and Maria are very valuable to me now. They're valuable to me because they are valuable to my children, my children who I love. The people here, sitting here this morning, your one another, my one another, they're to be valuable to us because they are valuable to God. When we look at the people sitting around us, when we see the members of the church here, we are to learn to see first and foremost before we see any of the other traits about them. The first thing our eyes should see is Christian. There is a person bought by the blood of Christ, a person that my God values enough that his son died for. I love my Savior. I love my God. And for that reason, I value who they love. We are to see Christian above all. We're not to see the external things that diminish their value in our eyes. We're to see the internal value that they possess because of Christ. We are to see people valued by God. Our value system is, is so easily skewered by our sin nature. We, we skewer it all the time. It's skewed off to the side it, because we put self at the center of our value system. We put ourselves there. And the call this morning really is to realign our value system so that self is not at the center, but God is. That we begin to value what God values. And there is no doubt that he values the people sitting in this room because he gave the most valuable thing he possessed, his son, to die for them. They are precious to God, the people sitting here. They are precious to God, and for that reason, they are to be precious to you and I. We're to value what God values. It's that simple. Genuine love seeks honor for others rather than self. As we think about that idea, it begins to, with thinking that we honor what we value. And second, we are to value what God values. We've considered both those points, but we cannot stop there. We, we need to consider a third point. We, we need to push on toward genuine love with a third point. We must work to show our value of others. We must work. Displaying honor, showing that someone is, is valued, it takes work. We must work to show our value of others. Look, look again at Paul's words. He says, give preference to one another in honor. Remember, I said the word that Paul used for honor is a, a common word. It's, it's not a hard word to understand. The same is not the case when it comes to the, the word we have translated here as give preference. Give preference. This is the only time in the New Testament where we find that particular word. The word we have translated give preference. The, the general meaning of the word is not too hard. We can figure out the general meaning, but it is a word that's hard to bring the idea into English. That's challenging. The idea that the verb has is, is that we go before, or we go ahead of something. And so as to be first in something. 
Several English translations, like the New American Standard, they, they tried to convey this idea of, of being ahead, going first, with give preference to one another. I, I'm not sure how well that captures the nuance, though. When, when I hear give preference to one another, the first idea that comes to my mind, and maybe my mind's strange, I don't know, but the first idea that comes to mind is that I am to think that other people are more worthy of honor than I am. I, I'm to place them he, ahead of myself in my mental list uh, of who deserves honor. You know, here's a listing and they ride ahead of me. I'm not sure that's right. Where we are to give appropriate honor. In less than a chapter, when we get into chapter 13, Paul wraps up a discussion on, on how we are to respect the authorities, the civil authorities, the governing authorities Paul's placed over us. He wraps up that discussion in, in verse 7 by saying, Render honor to whom honor is due. Believers are to be truth bearers. That's who we are to be. We are to reflect our true God. We're to be truth bearers. And, and as such, then, we cannot render honor in a false fashion. We cannot pretend that someone is, is worthy of a level of honor if they are not genuinely worthy of it. We, we cannot pretend that some of the people might be more worthy than ourselves in terms of accomplishments or efforts if that's what we think about here. It would be disingenuous to, to pretend that in some cases. Uh, of course, the idea of give preference does not mean that we have to place others above ourselves. It, it can simply mean that, that we are concerned about giving honor rather than receiving it. And I, I believe that, that we're more along the lines of what Paul means if we think of it in that sense. Paul is indicating in this characteristic of genuine love that, that we are to be more concerned about giving than receiving. We, we need to focus on, on giving to those we love rather than receiving from them. If we re-give preference in this second sense, that, that of concerning ourselves with, with giving rather than receiving, we're, we're drawing closer to what Paul means with this strange word he used, but I, I fear we might still be falling short in, in understanding that we, we might still be falling short in, in our actions because we don't understand fully. What we may miss still is the effort that is involved in this verb. The effort that this verb implies. The, the verb has the idea of going before or going ahead, but it has the idea of going before or going ahead of others with eagerness, with energy. The, the ESV translators, as well as the New American Standard in the margin, if you happen to have a New American that still has the marginal notes, um, they bring out this idea suggesting translation along the lines of outdo one another in showing honor. That, that translation, it, it carries that sense of energy that we should have, the effort that this verb Im implies. We are to outdo one another in, in the sense that we are showing love to others with energy. The problem with outdo is we're not in a competition with each other. We're, we're not to do it in a way that we, uh, that we make a competition out of it. Rather, we're to put forth strong effort, willing to put in more effort than anyone than, than we see in anyone else. We just put in everything we've got. Maybe it will help us to think about this a little bit if we think about the Kentucky Derby that was run last Saturday. I, I don't know if you've seen the, the replays of the Kentucky Derby, but if not, I really urge you to go home this afternoon and, and find it on the internet. It's easy to find. As of middle of the week, it was over 40 million replays had been done. So it's all over the internet. You, you don't have to work to find it. Without a doubt, this was one of the most amazing comeback races in history. It is an amazing Cinderella story that, uh, that the horse that won ran. If, if you haven't heard, the, the race was won by a horse by the name of Rich Strike. As far as I understand, he won with the longest odds of any horse ever to win the Kentucky Derby. 
A short time before the, the race, this horse was not even in the race. They, they only allowed 20 horses to run, and he was placed at number 21 in the rankings of the horses. He wasn't even scheduled to run. It, it was so close to race time that the owner was already texting his family and friends and said, well, we got close, but we're not going to be running. Then at the last minute, one of the 20 horses that qualified scratched, and they were pulled from the race for some reason, and Rich Strike moved up to that open 20th slot. For the bulk of the, bulk of the race, he, he ran just as he was expected to run. As he comes around the, 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 the final curve, he's in the 16th place, about where you'd expect him to be. And then he suddenly starts moving through the crowd, blasting forward. The, the announcers you know, on the race, if you listen to the, the, the live announcing, they're so focused on the front runners, they do not say his name until he passes the lead horse with about 10 strides to go. They say his name one time in the entire race as he takes the lead and wins. What we see when you watch that, that horse, that race, you see a horse that puts forth tremendous effort, nearly unbelievable effort. I think that is the picture of what Paul is telling us to be like here. We are to put forth tremendous effort, showing honor toward others. We, we don't measure ourselves against others. We, we, we simply give everything we have. We put forth all the efforts we can to show honor to others. We're to work hard at it, showing how greatly we hold the people sitting around us in honor, how much we value them. It doesn't mean that, that we'll pretend to honor someone who's not deserving of our honor. Rather, it means we'll work hard to show that we value the people here because God values them. We will honor them for the value that they hold in God's measuring system. These are people bought by the blood of Christ. How can we do that? How can we honor one another because of Christ? We want to honor people that Christ has saved. Well, there are countless ways, yet they all require work, hard work, sacrificial work, work that takes every ounce of our being. One way that I'll suggest is, is simply we invest time in helping others grow in their Christian walk. If Christ valued them enough to grow, die for them, and we know that Christ's purpose behind all that is so they will be like Christ, then we show honor to them by investing time in helping them become more like Christ. One thing we can truly and honestly value in one another is Christ. So helping each other grow in our relationship, coming to love Christ more, is a truly a valid way to show honor to everyone Christ died for. If you're already involved in a discipleship relationship with someone in this church, great. We've been talking about discipleship a lot in the last year. If you're not involved, talk to me or talk to Pastor Aaron after the, the service. Let us help you connect with someone. Invest your time in each other, helping you, one another, become like Christ. That is giving preference in honor. Another way in which we could show honor to one another is to work hard at eliminating the ways we dishonor each other. How many cutting remarks do, do we make that, that communicate some level of, of disdain for others? I don't even want to begin to count the number I make. How many throwaway comments do we make that, that discourage rather than encourage? Again, I don't want to count my own failures here. It takes work. If we want to use James' terminology, it takes work to bridle our tongue. That's what James says in 126, to bridle our tongue. That's what we're called to do, though. James makes it clear where to bridle our tongue. And that's what we must do if we're to show honor to one another. We, we have to stop and think about what we're going to say and how it will play out, how it will impact the person who hears it, how it will impact others around. Will it show that we value this person or will it communicate a level of disdain? Another way in which we can work hard to show that we value the people sitting around us is to make our time with them a priority. 
in our busy lives. What I mean by that, instead of letting other things push church times from our schedule, we schedule around our church times. After all, this is when we gather together as the body of Christ. This is when all the people that we know here that are part of our one another's are in one place showing what Christ has done for them. Praising God for what Christ has done. This should be the most important thing we can do with our week. If our goal is to show the people here that we value them because God values them, then demonstrating that spending time worshiping God with them certainly helps us reach our goal. It shows that we value them enough to make our time with them, sharing what God has done, the pinnacle event of our week, the, the center block of our schedules. Nothing can push out that which is most important to us. Whatever is important, we schedule around. I'm sure if we spent more time thinking about it, or if I opened up the floor this morning, I'm sure we could come up with many more suggestions of, of how we can and should work to show honor to each other. I'm not going to spend more time, though. Instead, I'm going to ask you, examine yourself. How are you doing? When you look at your life, how are you doing at showing honor to the other people in this room? Do you show that you value them? Are you putting forth effort, tremendous effort, nearly unbelievable effort in demonstrating that you value these people, that you show them value, that you see them valuable, that you show value of them because they've been bought by the blood of your Savior? Christ has made the people around you worthy of honor. Christ has made them valuable. Are you reflecting that through the efforts that you put forth? Like I said last week, the, the one another aspect that Paul writes it implies that, that there should re, be a reciprocal response. One another means as you're doing it for others, they're doing it for you. There, there should be reciprocal relationship here, a reciprocal response. If all of us are working hard to outdo one another, we're all putting all of our effort into showing honor to each other, how much we value each other because of Christ's work, there will be an exponential explosion of love in our church. But you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to worry about how much you're receiving from the other people around you. God and his spirit takes care of that in other people's lives. You're only responsible for you. You're only responsible for showing honor to others. Are you working to show how much you value others? Genuine love seeks honor for others rather than self. We must work to show our value of others. Back in Esther, Mordecai received honor from the king through Haman, even though Haman certainly did not want to honor Mordecai. It was the last thing on his list. By contrast, though, we should fervently desire to show honor to one another. We are to want to honor one another. We're commanded to honor one another. It is necessary for genuine love that we show honor to one another. It is one of the characteristics that demonstrate that we are men and women determined to show genuine love. Genuine love seeks honor for others rather than self. We honor what we value. We are to value what God values. We must work to show our value of others. Genuine love seeks honor for others rather than self. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would indeed work within us here this morning. Help us to each examine ourselves. How are we doing at showing honor to others? Are we meeting your standard? 
Are we valuing people because you value them? Are we working to show honor because you have given your son to make people around us precious? Father, we all can do more. We all can work harder to press forward with more energy, more determination, more intentionality. So I pray that you would show us how we need to do that. And may Christ be magnified. It's in his name we pray. Amen.